My name is David Coletta, and my wife and I are the senior leaders here at Mission Community Church. Before you watch this week's message, allow me to pray for you. Father, may your spirit touch everyone watching this video. May they encounter you and be receptive to your word in Jesus' name. Be blessed as you watch this week's message. It's all right. Let's worship our King.
what an honor it is to get to kick off this series on Psalm 23. Six verses, six weeks, going to take a break in there once, there's going to be a guest speaker. But what an honor. But, you know, on the other hand, it's a challenge. You know why it's a challenge? It's a challenge in a lot of ways, anytime you preach the Word of God. But it's particularly a challenge when people think that they already know it. I was doing a mic check, you know, before the service, and, and uh, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall. And, and Davy just picked up on it and started reciting the lines. He hadn't prepared. He hadn't thought, but we think we know it. We think we already know this stuff. And so whenever you speak on something that everyone thinks they already know, that's a real challenge. Oh, I'm going to preach on the Lord's Prayer today. I already know the Lord's Prayer. So you just kind of doze out, you know. I believe, I'm confident to say, by the end of this message, you will see there's a whole lot more than you ever dreamed or imagined in, in, this, in this passage and in this verse. We're just going to talk about Psalm 23, verse 1 today. Just one verse. But it's going to take our time really well. I believe it's the most, one of the most radical and audacious verses in the entire Bible. You think, oh, just the Lord is my shepherd. It's, it's radical. It's audacious. And, and I think we're also going to see something surprising. It's timely. It's thousands of years old, but it's timely. It addresses issues of your heart and my heart today and issues of our nation and the world today. Wow. So let's see where it goes here. Uh, first of all, we're going to read the whole thing, all six verses, and uh, let's just see what it says. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right path for his namesake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows." Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen, Amen indeed. And we're going with the NIV this series too, so just uh, see it that way. Well, this is Psalm 23. So what does that mean? Uh, this is going to be an interactive sort. I I'm tired of all these one-way messages. This is going to be interactive, okay? <laughs> So, here's a quiz. Here's your, I got a lot of quiz questions I'm going to share this message. Here's the first one. How many psalms are there in our Bible? One fifty. Okay. I could have spent more time. You could have kind of looked. Let's see. <laughs> yeah, there's 150. And this is number 23, but I believe... If we had to take a survey of thousands and thousands of Christians all around the world, this probably would be the Song of Psalms. The most familiar, the most impactful. Now, you might have another favorite. That's fine. This wasn't David's only psalm. He wrote some other amazing ones. But this one covers a lot of important ground. And uh, why is it? Why is it that this psalm has so resonated with people's life over the thousands of years? I believe whenever you see like even a country song, a rock song, a pop song that really gets big, it's because there's something in those lyrics or something in that message or something in Robert Whitlow's books. It resonates. It, it, it's relevant, you see? And the reason why Psalm 23 has been so impactful is because it covers issues that are timeless, that are timeless. Any day you read it, you say, wow, there's something in there for me. So Psalm 23, there's, it's the 23rd of, of the 150 things. It's a psalm. A psalm is a, a song, basically. This was their hymn, hymnal. The hymnal of, of the Israelite people. This is their hymnal. You know, oh, we're going to do Psalm 23 today. We're going to do Psalm 100 today. It, it was the hymnal. It was a sacred song. And, and here's the interesting thing, too. As you look at the overall picture of these 150 psalms, 
Every human emotion, every human emotion, I could say that without fear of contradiction, every human emotion that you could ever have or I would ever have is covered somewhere in Psalm 150, these 150 Psalms. Anger, any of you ever felt angry? Depression, loneliness, fear, confusion, desperation, repentance. It's all in the 150 Psalms in, in this hymnal. Wow, isn't that something? So what a great thing. Whatever you're going through today, whatever, whatever it is, whatever challenge, whatever downcast thing you face, it's in the Psalms somewhere. Isn't that a great thing? So David was a shepherd boy. He was a songwriter. He was a musician. But he eventually became a giant slayer. How about that? Those who worship, those who are in the presence of God can become giant slayers because we see that God is so much bigger than the giant. And, and he wasn't trying to be a giant slayer, frankly. He just came to the battleground. And he was, take, he was a servant. He came to bring food to his brothers. His brothers were just there, oh, a oh, giant sure is big, you know. Yeah. And David said, are you going to allow this to continue? Ah, I just about want to go way off on a rabbit trail. It's not a part of my notes at all. I think, I think David would say that today if he came to the body of Christ, if he came to your, this church or any church. He'd say, are you going to allow the stuff going on in this nation to continue? Are you going to not care, not pay attention? Are you going to be intimidated by the taunts of the enemy? Ah. David said, how, how long are you going to let this uncircumcised Philistine taunt us like this? Now, I don't know how he knew it was uncircumcised. That's, that's, that wasn't in my notes either, but I just thought, you know, he just, <laughs> he just assumed. <laughs> this, I don't think this guy's circumcised. <laughs> I got a feeling. <laughs> so he became a giant killer. And he eventually became king after some trials along the way. Isn't that something? And this is a poem. So in many of your Bibles, it's, it's written in a poetic kind of formatting. And a poem is picturesque. There's word pictures. There's visual kind of things. And that's why I like props. Visual. That's an important thing. And David had credibility to talk about shepherds and sheep and stuff because he was a shepherd boy. He himself was a shepherd, but here's an amazing thing too. He was a shepherd for his sheep, but he realized that he needed a shepherd. We as leaders in the church, pastors in the church, home group leaders, community group leaders, we're, we're trying to take care of other sheep, but the reality is we need the Lord to be our shepherd. And, and uh, my good buddy, Keith Chandler uh, pointed out to me several months ago, he said, you know, when you preach, there's a certain line you say all the time. You, are you aware of it? I said, no, not really. He said, you say all the time, you say, help us, Lord. <laughs> I didn't even know I was doing that. But then I started thinking about it. That's a pretty good prayer. Whatever you're going through today, whatever challenge you face today, wherever, whatever place you're in in this journey, that's a good prayer. Help us, Lord. I prayed that before I preached today. Help me, Lord. <laughs> oh, my. Well, I hope you got that. I hope you're praying that prayer because we need the Lord's help. You know, this can be the greatest message I've ever preached, but it could also bomb. If the Lord doesn't help, I'm aware of that. Help us, Lord. <laughs> oh, boy. Well, anyway, that's good. So I'm going to go through sort of phrase by phrase or word, uh, word by word here. And this is just one verse. We're going to talk about just this one verse the rest of this message. Isn't that something? The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. So you think you know it. The Lord that's pretty obvious, huh? First of all, it doesn't say that in Hebrew. It's, it's the Hebrew, uh, I can't even pronounce it, tetragrammaron. It, yeah, there, yeah, David said, I don't know, I never, I, that's beyond my pay grade, that, that word. But it's, 
It's Y-H-W-H. It's Yahweh or Jehovah, some of the older versions say. We don't even know how to pronounce it because they took the vowels out and all we got is Y-H-W-H. But it basically means the Lord in our English Bibles. But, they, they, but it's not just the Lord, like a title. It's a name. You see, he has a name. Whoever will call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. There's something powerful about that. This was a powerful name. And so if, if you would say the Lord is my shepherd or the Lord is my God to the Israelites, you know what they would, they would do? They'd say, what are you talking about? What are you talking about? Because they had a lot of gods. There's a lot of gods back then. There was Baal and Asherah. There was Molech, who's been in the news a little bit lately. Dagon, Chemosh, a bunch of gods, you see? And so when you said Yahweh, you were def defining something different. It was just the God of the universe. It was specific. It was the covenant name of God, the covenant God. And often that name was put with other adjectives. The Lord my shepherd, the Lord my provider, the Lord my peace, the Lord my healer, the names of God put with Yahweh. Wow. One of the uh, facts of our society is there's a lot of false shepherds. The Lord is my shepherd. There's a lot of false shepherds these days, you know. We'll depend on the government. We'll depend on this party or that party. We'll depend on this leader or that leader. We'll depend on our whatever. A lot of false shepherds. Jesus said in the last days, there will be false Christ, false shepherds. We got to be discerning. I think I even shared it at some message long ago. One of my favorite movie scenes of all time is in Elf. And Buddy the Elf was working at the department store, and they say, Santa's going to be here tomorrow. Oh, Buddy was so excited. <laughs> I know him. He's uh, Santa. Oh. And so he shows up for work the next day, and it's this department store Santa Claus. He said, you're not Santa. <laughs> I, I know Santa. You're not Santa. Do you know Jesus enough to realize when something isn't Jesus? Do you realize the Spirit of God enough to realize when something isn't the Spirit of God? It, it is a challenge. It is a challenge. Do you know him in that kind of way like Buddy the Elf knew, the real Santa, you know? And you know, it's interesting. The root of Yahweh, the Lord, is I am. And so all through the book of John particularly, seven times, seven different times, Jesus used those phrases. He, he said, I'm the tree of life. I'm the light of the world. I'm the door of the sheep. I'm the good shepherd. I'm the resurrection and the life. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. I'm the true vine. And guess what happened? You think people were delighted to hear that? Well, maybe some people were delighted, but, but the, the Jewish religious leaders were horrified because they realized what he was really saying. He's basically saying, look, I'm the I am. Now that's, that's scandalous. That was totally scandalous. But that's what it was all about. The names of God. In the names of God is our righteousness, our victory, our healer, our shepherd. And you know, it says in Exodus 20, he said, you will have no other gods before me. It's not enough that we're just, I kind of like them all, you know. Today, I kind of feel like Baal. I'm kind of feeling like Dagon today. I just, it's kind of a Dagon. No, no, no other gods. What a, what a powerful thing. I believe we are in a Mount Carmel, Mount Carmel moment where Elijah said, if God is God, serve him. If Baal is God, serve him. We're in that moment. And so this issue about who the Lord is, who's your God, who's your shepherd, 
This is very timely and very relevant because many people, just like the Israelites back then, they kind of had one foot in. I, I don't know how to do this, but you know, kind of one foot in and one foot out. You know, one foot in the Lord and one foot into who knows what. Help us, Lord. Torn between two opinions. Jesus said you can't have two masters. And then the reality is, too, what I've seen, is that some people, they're following the Lord, but then when times get tough, when times get hard, when they're under pressure in their relationships, in their work, in their finances, in different things, when times get tough, they turn to the other gods, they turn to... to drugs and alcohol and sex and porn and whatever else. They, they turn to other things because times were tough. It's nice that Jesus is your Lord on Sunday morning. It's nice that we're following him and we worship him today. The question is, when times get tough, is Jesus still your Lord? Are you still fully devoted to him? Wow. Well, anyway, thank you, Lord. So, the Lord is, <laughs> originally, my original version of this uh, message didn't even deal with that. Is, I mean, it's is, just a verb, right? And I've concluded this is one of the most important words in this entire verse, is. Not to get too political, but there was a politician back in the 1990s, and he was going through a, a certain case, and, and he said, it's all going to hinge on what the word is, is. Well, anyway, is is an important thing. And you know what it means? It means now. It means today. It means it's a present tense. And... What I see is many of us who've known the Lord for a while, if, if I had more time, I'd do a little survey. How many of you have known the Lord for five years, you know, for 10 years, for 15 years? For, I think I've known the Lord 50 years or so. That's great. But the question is, is. The Lord is. Yahweh is. Today is. The Bible says today is the day of salvation. Now is the acceptable time. Is, is Jesus the Lord today, now, present tense, not just past tense, not future tense. Jesus is going to come back someday. That's all good and true. But the reality is, I want to challenge this. Is Jesus Lord now in your life? Are you wholeheartedly devoted to him now? Oh, wow. Have you maintained an up-to-date relationship with God? Wow. Are we just talking about the good old days and things like that? I love Revelation uh, chapter 1, verse 8. He said, uh, I'm the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is, starts with the is, and who was, and who is to come. He covers all the bases. But today I want to talk about the is. You know, the Lord is my shepherd. What a, what a great thing. Wow. Well, the Lord is my shepherd. Let's look at that. The Lord is my shepherd. You know, this is part of the audacious part. You know, it's one thing to say that God so loves the world. But this is getting personal. This is God so loves me. The Lord is my shepherd. I mean, that, that's an audacious thing to say. I'm buddies, I'm friends with the, the Lord of the universe, the Lord of creation, the Lord of Israel. The Lord, I, I'm, I'm his sheep. I know him. <laughs> I mean, that is a, that's a pretty amazing thing to say, you know? It's like, like if we lived in some king, earthly kingdom, and it's, it's like saying, I know the king. We know the king. That's a pretty bold thing to say. But you know what? For many people, like I grew up in a, in a church, you know, and, and uh, we had these nice stained glass windows. It was awesome and everything. In my entire life that I can remember, I always believed there was a God out there. I wasn't an atheist. I believe there's a God out there that created this stuff. And I believe that Jesus was a historical figure. But until I really surrendered my life to him at age 18, he wasn't my shepherd. 
He was just some historical shepherd. He did a lot of great stuff 2,000 years ago. Is he your shepherd? That, that personal thing, that is something. This is eternal life, that they would know you, the true and living God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I, uh, I'm talking about a lot of movies today, I guess, but I, I also love the line. There's in, I think it's the second Superman movie or something. And Jimmy Olsen says to Lois Lane toward the end, he said, you know, Lois, I think Superman really likes you. <laughs> and Lois said, yeah, Superman likes everybody. I thought, that is a profound, that is a profound line. He has to love, you know, Superman, Superman, he has to love everybody. And so if I say to you today, God loves you. And you say, yeah, he has to, you know. <laughs> he loves everybody. <laughs> and that's true. He does love everybody. God so loved the world. He loves everybody. But hey, that's not going to get you very far. When the devil's on your case, when you're going through trials, when you're wondering if, if God's even real, it's not going to do much to say, well, he loves the world. No, you need to know. I need to know that he loves me. He's my shepherd. Wow. He loves me personally in a very special way. That's the amazing thing. Superman, yeah, he, he loves everybody, but he, he kind of liked Lois, by the way. That's a whole other message. <laughs> okay. So the Lord is my shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. You know, here's an amazing thing. Throughout the Bible... If you do some study, and I did some more study and I hadn't done for a while, you see that God has this special kinship with sheep. That's a weird thing, isn't it? Now, I, now I, don't have any, I don't have any particular kinship with sheep. I don't know any sheep by name. I've never taken care of any sheep. I don't call them friends. I mean, I don't. But, but God seemed throughout the Bible, not just in Psalm 23, he had this kinship with sheep. Now, other than Joseph and Mary, who were the first people that got to see baby Jesus? Shepherds. What? He could have found some politicians, some kings and princes and, you know, Farmers, I mean, there's a lot of other professions, but he, he went right after the shepherds. Ah, God has this shepherd's heart. And it's weird because back then, shepherds were kind of like low life, disreputable. It wasn't exactly the kind of career you, you necessarily wanted to go into. It was low class kind of thing. Well, here's another question. You know, I'm doing these quizzes here. Um, all the disciples were given a great commission to go into the, all the world, preach the gospel, and to go into all the world and make disciples, right? But Peter was given a special commission that only seemed to apply to him, at least that Jesus told him. What was that commission? Yeah, isn't that something? Feed my sheep. Feed my sheep. Wow. What, what an incredible thing. Why is that significant? Because the Lord cared about his sheep. He, he didn't want to just have his sheep just out there roaming around. He wanted somebody to care for his sheep. I just really like that. But you know what? Sheep take a lot of maintenance. <laughs> they take a lot of maintenance. They, they're not very self-reliant. And, and I thought of this verse. You've heard the verse before. You never probably thought about it. Luke chapter 15, verses 3 to 4. It says, uh, suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Now think about that. You have a hundred sheep, and all of a sudden, one of them's gone. <laughs> How do you lose a sheep? I mean, that just sounded like a funny story. <laughs> you, know, up, you know, you wake up, you talk to your wife. Well, I think we lost uh, Mabel. Uh, I don't know what happened to her. We only got 99 <laughs> sheep today. <laughs> but do you know why it's possible to lose a sheep? Because there's an old song. Maybe some of you know, probably know it. I don't, I don't know who wrote it or anything. It talks about I'm prone to wander. Sheep are prone to wander. Wow. 
Sheep take a lot of maintenance, and they're prone to wander. Wow, this is amazing stuff. <laughs> and it's also kind of a, a crazy thing that in John chapter 10, Jesus says, I'm the good shepherd. He just comes right out and says, I'm the good shepherd. This Psalm 23 thing that you've been talking about, singing about for years and years, I'm the good shepherd. But here's the, I mean, this is mind blowing. Jesus is the good shepherd. He's also the lamb of God. Whoa, how could that be? He's got all the bases covered. He's the shepherd, but he's also the lamb. Wow, this is incredible. And then here's something too. That I, I did, this is a powerful thing. So Jesus said he's the good shepherd who lays down his life for the sheep. Now, I had never thought a lot about that because I thought, well, you know, we as leaders of the church, we want to lay our life down for people. Jesus said, no greater love is anyone than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. That's cool. But he really was talking about the cross. He was talking about the ultimate laying down of his life, that he would die in the cross. He would die for our sins. He would die in our place for the penalty of our sins. Ah, but here's another quiz question for you. <clears throat> as wonderful as the cross was, as fantastic and incredible that sacrifice was, why was the cross by itself not sufficient to enable Jesus to be our shepherd? It must be a deep one here. Because a dead shepherd can't be a shepherd. This whole thing has to be a living shepherd. And Jesus rose from the dead. The resurrection is a whole vital part of the gospel message. You can't just say, and Jesus died for your sins. Good luck. I hope, hope, you, hope life works well for you. No, he died for our sins, but then he rose again as the great shepherd of the sheep. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for your cross, Lord. But thank you, Lord, for your resurrection. And you know what? We don't say this enough. There's a lot of world religions. Some of them have millions of people. But you know what? The founder of every one of the other world religions is dead. You can say they had good teachings, bad teachings, whatever. I don't even want to get into that today. But the fact of the matter is, Buddha, Confucius, Muhammad, even Moses, they're dead. But Jesus is alive. We have a living shepherd that can shepherd you in a living kind of way and bring all these blessings to pass in your life. Wow. Well, we're the final phrase of verse 1 here. The Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing. The amazing promises in Psalm 23 are contingent upon having a living relationship with a living Savior and following him all the days of your life. And Jesus said it. He said it real clearly, John chapter 10, verse 10. He said, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but I came to give you life and life abundantly. But in that context, the whole thing is talking about hearing his voice and following him, going where he says to go. And if you do that, he says you can have a situation where you lack nothing. Well, <laughs> this, is a, this is an interesting thing. This, uh, this is a really interesting thing. So, I have two sheep here, right? And, uh, and so let's, uh, I'm going to have uh, David Durham come up here. He's going to play Jesus here. And these sheep were both sinners, all sin and come short of the glory of God. And in, in 2004, you can just stay there, I think. In 2004, this is 20 years ago, nothing significant about that. Both of these sheep, these sinners, gave their heart to Jesus and said, Be my shepherd. That's the good news. That's fantastic. But one of the sheep 
didn't just stay at the altar and stay there, but went with the shepherd. And you can kind of walk over that way. <laughs> and stayed close to the shepherd. See, David was the most Jesus-like person I could find. <laughs> and uh, and so, so this sheep stayed with the shepherd, heard his voice, listened to him, had an intimate relationship with him. And, and that's an awesome thing. And now this one, now, this one gave his uh, life to, to the shepherd back in 20 years ago. But after that, he pretty much just laid around. <laughs> and he, he did go to some church services, listened to a lot of podcasts. He, he became an expert at what all the other people heard from God. But he never learned to hear from God. And he never really became a doer of the word. He was a hearer. A just, just a hearer, not a doer. And James chapter 1 says, you deceive yourself if you just hear and you don't do. And so, so this sheep, he heard some things. Maybe read a few devotional books, whatever. But he, I don't want to offend anybody, but hey, be offended, whatever. He just got plumper and plumper. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> uh, I love you guys, whatever, you know. <laughs> and this sheep got stronger and stronger. How many of you know that God wants us to be stronger and stronger spiritually? That is a key thing. He wants us to be doers of the word. Boy, didn't David do a good job? Yeah, thank you, David. That's awesome. I'm going to use you as Jesus some other time. That was fantastic. So two different sheep, two different lifestyles. One got stronger and stronger. The other was just lazier and plumper. And, and the reason why many believers experience chronic lack is because they have chronic unbelief and chronic disobedience. Wow. Well, let's look at a couple of verses here. These are radical too. Psalm 34 verse 10, David wrote. Those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. What, what do they lack? No good thing. That's an amazing verse. And then Matthew 6, 33, amazing. Liz read this. She didn't know what I was going to talk about, or she didn't have any idea I was going to talk about this. Seek first God's kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. So what's the common ingredient in these two verses? Seek. Seek. Those who seek the Lord will lack no good thing. And so I can confidently say today, you only have one need. You say, well, I got this need. I got this need. I got, I got a whole long prayer list. Of I got a lot of needs. You have one need. A seek the Lord need. And if you truly have that kind of heart to seek the Lord, he will deal with all the other stuff. He'll, all, he'll add all these other things that you think you need. Wow, isn't that something? But, but here's, it's so, uh, it, this has been on my heart so much in the last couple of years. A lot of people, in, in fact, probably this sheep guy here, he probably after about 20 years of this kind of thing said, you know what, I don't think God's promises work. All these promises and, and you'll have no lack. And I don't think it really works because he wasn't fulfilling the conditions. Every verse in the Bible that gives a promise pretty much has, here's what you do. Here's what, here's what you do. And if you do this, I'll do that. Wow. Help us, Lord. As Keith reminded me, I'll tell you, it's, it's a good prayer. Help us, Lord. <laughs> we're we're, we're going to wrap up in just a minute, but let's look at the next slide because uh, let's be honest. Frankly, churches are not known for our honesty. <laughs> that has nothing to do with my message, but boy, oh boy, that just really hit me. Let's be honest. You know, we want to sugarcoat everything. Oh, you know, everything's wonderful. Things are great. You know, the reality is, here's the reality. Every one of us, every one of us, I, I have no fear of contradiction. Every one of us has experienced lack at one time or another in our life. Severe lack, little bit of lack, all kinds of, all kind of lack. I have, I bet you have. 
And the interesting thing is in the Bible, in the Bible, there's lack a lot of different times. Now, sometimes the lack was so that God would get people to where they needed to go. Jacob and his family were experiencing a famine, and that got him to Egypt, and that got a lot of good stuff to happen and some challenging stuff to happen. Naomi and her husband went to Moab because of the famine, and that's where they met Ruth. Elijah had the stream dry up. Have any of you had your stream dry up? God, you told me to be here, and then the stream dried up. Oh, and here's the deal. Me and my family, technically the best grammar would be my family and I, but <laughs> me and my family are in Charlotte today because the stream dried up in Ohio and in Florida. And so here we are. I mean, that's a good time to clap. You know, you wouldn't even know me today. <laughs> you wouldn't even know me today if I was thriving in Ohio or thriving in Florida. No, God sent lack to move me on in his sovereign purposes. Wow, isn't that something? So sometimes the lack is part of God's sovereign purposes. That's an amazing thing. But you know, my favorite, and I've probably shared this many times, my favorite story of lack in the Bible is probably John chapter 2. And they had a wedding feast, and they ran out of wine. They had lack. There was a lack. And then this great line by Jesus' mother told the servants, you know, whatever he says to do, do it. That's the key. That's the key. Whatever lack you are dealing with today. A lack of relationships, a lack of money, a lack of, you need a job, need a, uh, whatever. Whatever Jesus tells you to do, do it. Whoa. So do you need to, uh, you need to catch some fish? Here's where you put your net. You need money for taxes? Go catch a fish for that too. And there's a coin that's going to be in its mouth. Need a ride into town? Hey, there's a, there's a cold over there. Just go untie the cold and say the master has need of it. You need, we need to listen and obey. That's the key to all this stuff. And here's David's conclusion about this lack thing. Psalm 37, verse 25. I was young, and now I'm old. I've never seen the righteous forsaken or their children begging bread. Now, that's quite a statement. That is quite a statement because we have, like I say, we've all faced lack. But we don't have to stay in the lack. We really don't. And then you're going to think I'm a prosperity preacher. Yes, I am. I'm a prosperity preacher. Go to the next slide here. This is one of my favorite verses in the Bible too. Genesis 12, 2, God's promise to Abraham. He said, I want to bless you and I want to make you a blessing. The problem with so much of the prosperity message is it's all narcissistic. It's all self-centered. It's, I want to have a bigger house, a nicer car. I want to impress the neighbors. But God wants to bless us so we can bless others. That's what it's about. And, and this is a spoiler alert. Later in Psalm 23, he, he's not just talking about you will have no lack. He says, your cup's going to overflow. Man, I love that. I'm not just going to, if we had more time, I'd do, you show that prop to, you know, here's a picture. You know, and, and, and so many of us, we would be satisfied just to have our own needs met, just to pay our own bills, just, just to get our own stuff going, just to have our own car work or fix the roof over our house, whatever. God wants so much more for you than that. He wants you to have a cup that overflows. He wants to flow from you to, to the lives of other people. Wow, isn't that something? Help us, Lord. Not just to meet our needs, Philippians 4, 19, but to, to flow out. Proverbs eleven twenty five. 25, a generous person will prosper. Whoever refreshes others will be refreshed themselves. Wow. Well, <laughs> So a couple more things. Here's the contrast. What happens if the Lord is not our shepherd or we're not living in a close personal relationship with him? Well, Jesus tells us. Let's look at the next, the next slide. Uh, the, the blessings of Psalm 23 are not automatic. 
They're, they're based upon following him, knowing him. And, and here's what he said. He said, I looked at the crowds and I have compassion on them because they're harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Other translations said that they were confused. Any of you ever been confused? They were bewildered. They were aimless. You ever felt aimless? They were distressed, dejected, dispirited, weary, or downcast. That's how Jesus saw people. Now, some of us have gone out on outreaches lately. Uh, David Durham goes to Dream Center Outreach uptown every Friday night. And you see people that are like this. They're downcast. They're they're hurt, they're harassed, they're helpless. They're like sheep without a shepherd. They're, it's not just that they're evil or bad, but they're, they're like sheep without a shepherd. And here's that last word, downcast. I love that. Yeah. That's a picture of me before the meeting. <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> downcast had a specific meaning that shepherds understood when sheep get on their back and their organs press against them and they have those little legs they can't get up they're helpless you know what if you're helpless today if you're downcast psalm 42 says why are you downcast my soul some of us have experienced this being downcast Help us, Lord. We are downcast, Lord. God wants us, wants to set us up again. Wow. You know, I, I would demonstrate this, but I, I might not be able to get up, so it could be, <laughs> it could be bad. Well, I just want to tell you a, a quick little funny story, and then we're going to kind of wrap it up here. After uh, I got saved when I was in high school, I went to college, and I remember about a year in after I was saved, I was at my college at Denison University, and I was depressed. I was downcast. I wasn't, wasn't happy about things. And it was kind of like the Lord had disappeared. Have you ever had a time like that? Where you just say, gosh, I don't feel him anymore. I don't sense him anymore. I don't hear his voice right now. And, and, and so I go for a walk. It's dark at night, I'm by myself, just going down the streets, kind of feeling sorry for myself. And this guy kind of pops out of nowhere, coming the other direction. And he says, is a shepherd out tonight? I said, he sure is. And then I realized he wasn't talking about the Lord. <laughs> he was talking about some German shepherd <laughs> that lived, lived down the street. But, but, but it jarred me back to my senses. The shepherd was out. The shepherd was with me. It was a dark valley like Psalm 23 talks about, but he was with me. And all of a sudden, my countenance changed. <laughs> the shepherd is out tonight. I have good news for you. The shepherd is out tonight. He's here with you today. The shepherd is here. It's not just some German shepherd dog. It's the Lord of Lords. It's Yahweh, the God of gods. Wow. Well, we're going to sing a little song together, but I want to, in case you weren't uh, taking notes, which I'm sure you were taking notes, weren't you? <laughs> Here's the takeaways. Four things here. If you're feeling downcast and stuck today, your good shepherd can turn you upright. <laughs> Any of you a candidate for that? Psalm 23, number two, Psalm 23 is a challenge to not only look to Jesus as your Savior, but also as your source and your provider. Yes, Jesus will get you to heaven, but in the meantime, he wants to be Jehovah Jireh, Yahweh, your provider. Number three, to experience the Lord's full blessings, you have to listen to his voice and follow his instructions. Draw near to him. He'll draw near to you. And the last one, God wants you to have a vision to be so blessed. I want to drive this home. He wants you to be so blessed that you can be generous and bless others. Mm. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for watching this week's message. If you live in the Charlotte area, we will love it if you joined us for worship this Sunday at 10 a.m. And if you would like to give to this ministry and help us spread the good news of Jesus, 
you can give on our website at missioncommunity.cc. Hey, before you go, make sure that you subscribe to our YouTube channel so you don't miss out on any of the latest content and messages. Thank you for watching. God bless you.